I'm Josna Regge, the current director of Worcester State's new interdisciplinary global studies program. I also teach in the English department, post-colonial world literatures and US ethnic literatures. I want to start by thanking our sponsors uh, for this event, our co-sponsors, the Academic Affairs Office, the Women's Studies Program, the Honors Program, the Center for the Study of Human Rights, and several departments, Health Sciences, English, Philosophy, and World Languages. Our main speaker, Dr. Riva Adler, will speak for approximately 30 minutes on the topic addressing the root causes of genocide at home and abroad, gender, behavior, and public health. In many, many former incarnations ago, when we were both environmental activists, during one stage in her medical study, she was based at Harlem Hospital in New York. I remember her comment after attending a global health conference. She said that her patients at Harlem Hospital with a high incidence of diseases like tuberculosis had all the health conditions and more expected of people in a struggling country in the developing world. So Dr. Adler has always been concerned with health and well-being at home as well as abroad. Welcome to the United States, back to the United States, and welcome to Worcester State. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody sitting here today who's come out on a very busy school day in March on a gorgeous sunny day, the first one you know, we've had in a very long time, to hear someone talk about genocide prevention, arguably one of the world's grimmest, but paradoxically perhaps one of our most hopeful subjects. So this is Rwanda. This is a tea plantation in Rwanda near the Isova prison, which is one of the most remote parts of the country. It's extremely beautiful. Next slide, please. This is actually on the road on the way, and this is just a typical market in Rwanda from about four years ago, but I would say that probably today it's looking very much the same, except everybody now would be wearing shoes. There's a universal shoe program in Rwanda, and now everybody has them. Next slide, please. This is actually the team that uh, generated all the research in Rwanda for us, and as you can see, it was an all Rwandese team, with the exception of myself and one research assistant. Next slide, please. And lest any of you students think that this is actually way too complicated for you, this was our office. <laughs> So anybody can do this if you, where there's a will, there's a way. It really wasn't that complicated. It cost us very little money, and it was actually something very, very doable. Next slide, please. Fine. So what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about what people told us in Rwanda and Darfur before, uh, what they, we, okay, let me go back a bit. What we did was we went to Rwanda, and then later we went to Darfur. Today I'm only going to be telling you about the data in Rwanda. Dr. Greg has given me exactly a half an hour, and I intend to stick to it. Uh, for anyone who's interested in the Darfur data, I'm really perfectly happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, so what we did was we went to Rwanda and Darfur, and we conducted um, numerous interviews. We conducted 567 uh, two-hour interviews and surveys in Rwanda. Not all 567 were interviews, many surveys. And then we went to Darfur, and we conducted over 100 interviews, no surveys in Darfur. It was too difficult to do. And we asked people a series of questions about what their lives were like before the genocide and what their lives were like during the genocide to try to figure out what some of their behaviors and attitudes were that drove them to commit this violence and why they thought it was a good idea at the time. Okay. So as you can see, I'm going to step up to the plate again for this part of my loud voice. People both to all the populations told us that their lives were based on mutual aid. Everybody worked together, they farmed together, they herded together, they helped people when they were sick, they took care of widows, children were all cared for if they were orphaned. And in fact, our data, our background data, tends to indicate that all of this was true. Neighbors got along, uh, and um, everything seemed to be fine. And then at some point, there was a governmental change, at which point the governments started pitting populations against one another. In Rwanda, it was the 1959 post-colonial revolution. And in Darfur, it was actually the drought of 1986, when the government left over a million people simply to starve to death because they helped them with no food allowance at all, and then got them to fight one another for food. They thought that was a better idea than actually helping their own people. So what happened after that was civil war starts, as it usually does, because nobody's going to put up with that forever. And then the government starts to escalate dehumanizing propaganda to get people to start uh, fearing and hating one another, both places. And then in Rwanda, of course, the civilian Hutu militias were chained, armed, and deployed as they were uh, uh, in uh, uh, Sudan, but called the Janjaweed. So in fact, this is basically how things seem to sort every single time that we've looked, and we've now looked three times, this is all fairly standard. Next slide. What I want to talk about now in Rwanda, since this is International Women's Day, is I thought I would focus for a little while on the gender roles that might be applicable to these sorts of issues. Four, men sat at the head of households legally, 
Women could not inherit property or enter into any legal agreement legally without the permission of her husband or father, open a bank account without spousal permission, or have any legal rights at all, couldn't own land, nothing. On the average, women were less educated than men, and few women held positions of authority within any echelon of government. There were a few, but only a very few, and you could count them basically on one hand. <coughs> Next slide, please. Men, on the other hand, were seen as family breadwinners. The majority of Rwandan soldiers, legislators, and municipal officials were all men. Men were responsible for national and local security, which is not surprising. Rwandan men were said to be respected for observing much and saying little, providing financially for their wives and children, educating their children, protecting their families in case of attack by animals in the fields or by any other kind of problem, uh, and defending their communities from external threats such as war, as well as more commonplace violence, such as um, sexual violence against women or just somebody getting into a fistfight with their <coughs> son, for example. That was the role, of uh, was protector. Next slide. Women's roles before 1994 in Rwanda were somewhat different. Gender roles for women emphasized hard work without complaint. Women were responsible for most of the agriculture and almost all of the child rearing. Homemaking, rearing and disciplining of children, which is somewhat different, I think, than some North American cultures may be used to. Faithfulness to partners. And making a subsistence uh, agriculture success having a small garden plot and actually being able to feed your family if you were lucky enough to have a plot. So women and men had uh, very, very large responsibilities, but they were, before the genocide, very divided. Next slide. So, when we talked to Rwandan men and women about why they participated in the genocide, I'm no, now going to go through a series of findings um, which will be in the form of quotes of what people told us. I would like to point out that there were many fewer women in Rwanda who actually engaged in hands-on violence or aggressive support of the genocide. Most women were actually bystanders and kind of rooting from the sidelines if they were involved. But we did actually find 10 women who were actively involved in the genocide and had confessed to genocide-related crimes for one reason or another. But we found, obviously, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of men. So I wouldn't want anyone to think that this is actually an even sample. It was a qualitative, it was a qua qualitative not a quantitative sample. So there was no reason, actually, to have the, uh, the uh, cohorts be equal-sized. This is what Rwandan men told us about defending their country when they felt the genocide was um, about to occur. But these were the things that we found when people told us why they felt it was very important to engage in violence against their neighbors. The first thing men told us were, was that they were driven to defend themselves, their family, and their nation. And this was a, a perfectly good example quote. Deep inside, I wanted to fight to my last drop of blood because our leaders were telling us that if the cockroaches, meaning the Tutsis, took power, they would put us into slavery and we would all be killed. We didn't want that to happen, and that's why I said I wanted to fight. And in terms of their masculinity obligations, this is what men told us. In the beginning, I never supported the genocide because at home they warned me never to get involved. I don't know what got into me, but I came to believe the stories about ethnicity and indulged myself in killing. I think it was due to peer pressure and being afraid that at times I would be called a coward. And then after that, there was a sentence that said by my other peer uh, group of men. And then someone else said, in our family we were 12 children and our land wasn't fertile. I always worried about my future source of income because I would have to raise a family and a hungry woman never respects her husband. Mm -hmm. So there were really tremendous obligations in terms of gender in Rwanda to be able to fulfill someone's capacity as a man. Next. Women, on the other hand, were mostly supporters, and I'll read you some quotes about what women said about why they participated. The most important reasons were this. Things like, I really hated Tutsis because everyone knew that they were all in support of the rebels. There was actually a civil war going on at the time in Rwanda. Um, we thought that the Tutsis would all be killed and that nothing would happen afterwards, that no one would be punished for having killed them. So women were on the sidelines rooting for, for this killing just the same, not necessarily picking up a weapon, but thinking it was really good that they were being killed and nobody was gonna call them to account. And then another quote, men were more active in the killings, but women played a big role in the killings as well because they could have advised their husbands not to kill innocent people, but they didn't. 
So you can see that women were, as men came home at night, women were sort of cheering them on and giving them a healthy dinner, telling them they did right. It was that people wanted to acquire others' belongings. The leaders used to tell us that before we took Tutsi's cows or possessions, we had to make sure that the owner would not come back to claim them. So I think that statement pretty much speaks for itself. Next slide, please. And women were also greedy. Women were supporting their husbands to carry out killings. You may even find such women here in prison who defend themselves by saying, my husband would ask me for his machete, and I knew where it was, so do you think that I could refuse him? Uh, though you could not avoid uh, giving him the machete, why did you also cheer the killers on or undress and plunder the victims? Because you were very happy that the Tutsis were dying. So in fact, the women also wanted to acquire other people's possessions, and were sort of saying, well, it wasn't my fault the men were actually doing it, but in fact, the attitudes were very much the same. Next slide. This young man said, there was a problem which I can describe being drowned like an island. The government didn't control anything, and we were believed we were all going to die. People were looting and killing. We felt it was chaos. No one knew how or when it would stop, or who it would stop, who would stop it. So people were feeling like their whole lives were just out of control. What was happening was beyond belief for me. I think I felt and thought like it was the judgment day people talked about. You know, I was still young then, and I believed it was really the final day. We actually had three youth, youth um, respondents out of 20 who said that they felt that they believed absolutely that they were living through the real biblical apocalypse. They thought this. So what I'm trying to say is that genocide is always caused by a perfect storm. It's caused by a perfect storm of socio-political conditions. And what we have found both in Rwanda and Darfur is that, is that it's also caused by a perfect storm of personal and attitudinal conditions. So you need hatred. You need a history of hatred in the community from long back that your neighbors are not good people and that they need to be eliminated. You need um, fear of ruling authorities to force you to do things you may not necessarily be in your best interest, but you're afraid not to do them. Um, you need a militarized civil society and people with weapons in order to be able to do these kinds of things. You need um, a lot of social chaos that sort of propel people forward. Uh, in Rwanda, you had a huge youth bulge, which we're not going to talk about today, but we can talk about that later. It's a very important problem. And that all leads to the catastrophe. Next slide. Lest you think this has nothing to do with you, um, I realize that I'm talking about something that happened very, very far away, but I'd like to try to draw some, some direct, um, direct connections to Worcester for the next minute or two. Um, so 80% of the healthcare personnel during the 1994 uh, Rwandan genocide fled. Um, Rwanda, before the genocide, was spending $100 million of their own GDP on healthcare. Next slide, or next, next thing. But after the genocide, they were actually spending as much money as that on needs that were astronomically larger, as I'm sure you can imagine, because everybody was so injured and ill. And actually, 90% of all the funds were coming from outside governments now instead of inside the Rwandan government. So we were actually paying for this. Next slide. So in 1992, as I said, Rwanda was spending $100 million GDP on health care. But one year after the genocide, the US uh, government was spending a $1 million a day on the 1.9 million refugees outside of the country. And that's a very controversial issue that we can also take up later. Many of those refugees were actually part of the perpetrator group, not the victim group. This accounted for 80% of the Rwandan government expenditures in 1992, and 57% of the entire USAID 1995 budget, which meant that $80 were being spent on every Rwandan in the camps, and 50 cents was being spent on the rest of the 97.7% of people living in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is where your tax dollars were going in 1994 after the Rwandan genocide. The international global community always ends up the victims pay the most, the perpetrators, I believe, pay the second most and the trauma they do to themselves. And then after that, the international and global community pays the rest of the price. So I think that it's really true that all of us can be fearful and all of us can want to be protected and all of us can allow a lot of things to happen because we believe it's better for us even though it's not better for others. So this really isn't a phenomenon that just affects others, it also affects us. Next slide. In our research, what we've been trying to do is ascertain those things that separate us and then in our work in Darfur, trying to put it all back together by lowering those separations and bringing people back together so they actually know each other and see if they can work together for a healthier future. I thank you for your attention and I'm very- One of the things I think we can take from, from Dr. Adler's talk um, that's very important is looking for non-military alternatives to dealing with genocide even once genocidal dynamics become visible. And one of the challenges of prevention of genocide is it 
real prevention of genocide has to happen before anyone could be aware, really, that any potential problem is coming. By the time we're, we're looking at societies where genocides are happening, usually it, it's very hard to intervene. Um, and the, the kind of stock answer is always a, a kind of brute force military method that is a little bit like um, dealing with a headache by you know chopping off someone's head. It's not necessarily excuse that very crude analogy, no, but it's but it's a happy. little bit it, it, it's a little bit you know the 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 impact of those kinds of interventions oftentimes are so destabilizing and and um, so devastating for everybody involved that long term. Um, there's a real question about how effective they are, even if they stop a, a certain kind of violence at the moment when the intervention happens. So I think this notion of trying to figure out how, and, and, and I think that, that we've seen this discussion today, how to try to intervene in a much more precise, thoughtful, and nonviolent way against violence is a really important step, and I think we need to be really focusing on this.